Well, let's come back today to Matthew chapter 17. We're looking at the cross style of Jesus Christ as Matthew portrays it uh, through the lips of Jesus, through the demonstration of Jesus, through the teachings of Jesus, as he talks strongly to his disciples about this one single factor. We're looking, as you remember, at the last six months of the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's absolutely stuck on this one idea. He's pulling his disciples aside out of uh, Judaism into Gentile territory and he's unloading on them. He's maintaining a focus that he's not going to get off of. Every single thing he's going to talk about is going to come under this umbrella, this overwhelming emphasis, this one single focus of the cross and its style. He's calling everyone to deny themselves, uh, take up their cross, follow after him. This is his main thrust. He's telling them that this is the fundamental of the kingdom of God and there's no way out of it. This is exactly what he's calling them to. So Matthew chapter 16 is the consideration of the cross style. We've been focusing strongly on Matthew chapter 17. It's the confirmation of the cross style. We have moved into the first scene where we see, of course, the Mount of Transfiguration and what an overwhelming scene it is. We have discovered that it is a confirmation, not of his Messiahship. It's not talking about his divinity. It's talking about the content of his Messiahship. He is a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah. This is the only possibility we have of winning the world. And he's bringing them back to it again and again and again. In fact, Moses and Elijah come down in the moment of Mount, Mount of Transfiguration and literally carry on a conversation with Jesus about the cross, which verifies that this is the emphasis. This is where they're going. This is what the heavenlies are talking about. This is what really matters. Hey, you've got to be a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah, Jesus. It's the only way righteousness will ever come to the world. Here is the way we're going to redeem our world. We're going to bleed, suffer, and die and pour our lives out. And of course then the Heavenly Father overshadows the place and He brings a verification. For He says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Hey, listen to Him and Him alone because He's telling you the truth. Don't listen to your feelings. Don't listen to the way you've always been trained. Don't listen to what you've always thought. Don't listen to your traditions. Don't listen to the easy way out. Don't listen to the subtle suggestions of the devil. Hey, come back to that which matters and that which matters alone. Christ, he has something to say to you and he's giving you this new material. I'm telling you, he's a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah. You've got to come back to this. And so... Again, we have a verification. Moses and Elijah, the Old Testament, verify it. Hey, the Heavenly Father comes down and verifies it. And then the amazing truth of the uh, Mount of Transfiguration itself, the very moment of the Transfiguration, confirms it. For it tells us that what is being revealed through Jesus in a physical manifestation is exactly what He's calling us to. Jesus has something inside that is literally flowing out of him. There is the wonder of the glory of God, the fullness of the Spirit. He's operating under the power of God. And the very essence of that is taking place within him. And that's what Jesus is calling every single one of us to. He was telling the disciples that this is a physical manifestation of the very glory of God that's flowing in and through me. So you can physically see it happen, man. It was a radiation from within, not a reflection from without. A radiation from within. And this kind of involvement in God, this kind of oneness with the Father, this kind of, this kind of change in your life cannot take place unless there is a cross. Hey, we've got to bleed, suffer, and die man, I've got to go to a cross. You'll never get into relationship with the Father unless I go and die on a cross. You'll never get into relationship with each other unless you die to, die to yourself. So I'm calling you to the life of the cross. Come on, ministry happens here. This is how the glory of God shines through your life. It shines through in the essence of the style of the cross. So he again verifies it in the very essence of the transfiguration itself. So everywhere you turn in this first paragraph of this great chapter, we are finding the style of the cross is being verified. What Jesus told his disciples is exactly the truth. And he's going to continue to tell them and continue to talk to us about the same message, calling us to losing our lives, giving ourselves up. Today we're moving to the second paragraph, which is verse 9 down through verse 13. And it's a most interesting paragraph because it brings up the subject of John the Baptist and what has happened in the past and some experiences the disciples have had. It brings up some confusions that the disciples have. They're talking about a question they've got. 
due to what they've been taught, their tradition, kinds of things that have been handed to them. And it shows us some revelation about the very essence of the person of John the Baptist and how significant he was in this whole business of the style of the cross and the kind of role he played and of course the kind of role that Jesus is calling us to play in the ministry of the style of the cross. It begins at verse 9, takes us down through verse 13. Here's what it says. Let's, let's read it together. Again, the reading of the word is so significant. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Amazing passage. John the Baptist played a strategic role in the whole flow of the Messiah and the redemption, therefore the redemption of the world. He was an interesting individual. We see him highlighted here. Disciples were totally confused about him. Reason being what they had been taught and their, all of their past and their tradition as they had been taught what John the Baptist, who John the Baptist, that is the forerunner, was really going to be. Had a misconception. A lot of our problems abide there, don't they? misconception, the way we view things, uh, what we've been taught, what we thought, how we think it's going to work out, how we think it's going to manifest itself. Then when God reveals himself in a way that we aren't expecting, we don't recognize him, bypass him, go right on wondering where God is, why he hasn't spoken to us. Um, you see that so often. You remember the story, guy was sitting on a roof house. Uh, the roof of his house. He was water flood, flooded man and hey it was desperate and rescue boats were coming up and down. All kinds of things were happening and this man was sitting out there on the top of his roof. He'd been praying, oh God uh, rescue me, oh God rescue me, oh God rescue me. I'm counting on you God. About that time a boat came by and said, hey mister uh, be glad to take you in. He said, no that's alright. You go on. I'm waiting. Uh, I'm going to be rescued but I'm waiting. And he kept praying, oh God would you rescue me? Oh God, would you rescue me? Oh God, would you rescue me? About that time, another boat came rolling by and said, Hey, I'll take you in, sir. Hey, you can be safe. No, he said, that's okay. I'm waiting. And he kept praying, Oh God, rescue me. Oh God, rescue me. Oh God, rescue me. About that time, a helicopter came by and, uh, and get, sent the message down to him. Hey, we'll drop a ladder down to you. You can tie yourself on. We'll haul you back up. Uh, on this rope ladder but hey he said that's okay you go on I'm, I'm waiting I'm going to be rescued oh God rescue me oh God rescue me about that time the water got higher and higher and over flooded him and he drowned and he found himself in heaven and in talking to God one day he said God you know I was on that rooftop and I was really asking you to rescue me wondered why you wouldn't I don't, I don't know why you didn't rescue me God I was counting on you rescue me he said, good night. God said, good night, man. I sent two boats and a helicopter to rescue you. But see, he didn't recognize it. He, he didn't see. He, he, he was looking through. See, the disciples are like that. Oh, hey, God is all over them. They're not seeing it. John the Baptist has come. They didn't get it. Judaism was that way. The Messiah was walking up and down their streets. And can you see the tragedy of it? They didn't clue in, man. They didn't have a clue. They treated him like dirt. They ended up nailing him to a tree. The very Son of God, the one they had been waiting on all of this time, they did not recognize him. See, God didn't send the right kind of boat. He didn't come in the right kind of form. They didn't get it. Hey, I don't want to be that way, man. I, I want to be open to the message of God. Oh God, I want to be, I want you to come as you want to come. I give no dictates to you. I don't want to be stuck in my rut. I don't want to, I want you to stretch me into the truth you want to reveal to me. I'm available to you, oh God. Bring your revelation to me. Uh, you see that kind of emphasis going on in this paragraph. Verse 9 down through verse 13. Yeah, it's really interesting. One of, the, one of the things that I've struggled with through my life, I'm sure 
as you have. And one of the things I've noticed as you grow up is that um, there's a way that people perceive you uh, over against the way you perceive yourself. See, I, I, I see this all the time in my own life. See, the way I perceive myself, the way I perceive I am, uh, the kind of person I am, kind of things that have been done in, in and through my life, and the way other people perceive me and the way they view me, two different things altogether. Same person, two different viewpoints. I look at myself and say, wow, I don't see myself that, like that at all. wonder why they see. What is it about me that causes them to see me in that kind of perspective and in that kind of light? And of course the danger is always that we would be overrated by other people and underrate ourselves. In other words, other people would look at us and see great potential, great possibility. Whoa, look what's happened. Look what God is doing through your life. We would look at ourselves and say, hey, I haven't done anything. Nothing's happened. Hey, I'm, I'm really worthless. Don't even know why the church puts up with me. Uh, and we would underrate ourselves over against the perspective of others that might overrate us because they are impressed with a moment of stardom or you really pulled it off, you know. You preached in a service and God really came and man, you really pulled it off. Uh, and so they thought you were great where, okay, last 15 times you preached, it was dead or in a doornail, nothing happened. So how do you rate all that, see? How do, how do you look at yourself and have a proper perspective of really who you are and what God is doing in and through your lives? I suppose that most of us, most of us would view ourselves as, uh, what would we call it, ordinary people. Hey, we're just, we're just ordinary people, put our pants on one leg at a time, hey, uh, have to buy a new pair of shoes every now and then, and need deodorant. We're just ordinary, run-of-the-mill kind of people, nothing, nothing outstanding. We view ourselves like that. And when we take ourselves and we stack ourselves up against the millions and millions of people that have lived and, and the hundreds of thousands of people and the hundreds of generations that have come and gone and we, we look our, at ourselves in comparison to everybody else, we kind of shrug our shoulders and say, well, hey, I lived an ordinary life, really didn't do anything all that hot. Uh, daily life routines, you know, got up in the morning, went to my job, came home, ate some supper, went to bed, got up in the morning, uh, went to my job, came home, ate some supper, went to bed, got up in the morning, went to my job, hey, just life spent, 80 years gone by, what did it mean? Really didn't do anything that would count for history. You know, nothing that anybody's going to write up in the history books like, Whoa, if I could have invented it, if I could have discovered a cure for cancer. Hey, they'd have put my name on the, on the medicine and, and or on the shot or whatever. And wow, I'd be, hey, they'd remember my name forever. But hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And if I could invent some fantastic thing that would make life easier and, and, and would be used around the household every single day, they'd probably put my name on that instrument, that thing, that invention, and, and I'd be remembered and written up in the history books. But hey... I'm not going to invent anything, man. I'm not going to pull that off. If I'd come up with a, some kind of an answer for world hunger, maybe they would, they would put that formula, maybe it's a formula for growing things or whatever, and, and they would put my name on that, and I, I would be, again, remembered forever and ever by every, by every generation for saving the nations of the world. But see, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I just, I just, I'm just me. I just get up, eat some breakfast, and live an ordinary life, do ordinary things, struggle with ordinary problems, trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my, about my tires, and, and I'm, just, I'm just an average type guy wondering, good night, what am I going to wear tonight? Uh, is there anything clean? See, I'm, I'm just an average type guy. Just, just, just ordinary, an ordinary, ordinary kind of person. But I would say to you that there are some of us that are, well, we have a drive, we have a, we have a burn. Maybe you're one of those. We have an overwhelming concern. We're, hey, wait, whoa. We're not, we're not interested. I'm not interested. I'm really not interested in doing anything to get my name in the history books. Really don't care a rip about that. Really not interested in doing anything about, because uh, I don't have the ability. 
Um, not going to do anything about the cancer or the world hunger, all the, all the big stuff, you know. Re really not going to get that done. And really don't have any concern about inventing some kind of instrument that would get my name attached to it and I'd be written up in the history books. That, that's no concern for me. Really don't even want that. You know what I'd like to do? Whew. I'd like to double up my fist and I'd literally, literally like to suck eternity square in the belly and double her over, man. I'd, I'd like to make an overwhelming impact in the eternities uh, of, my, of my world, my universe. See, I'd, I'd like to get involved in something that would literally affect forever and ever and ever. I, I'm not interested in a puny little deal that a little gadget that would make some housewife's life easier. What I'm really interested in, if I could make a difference, if I could make a difference, if I could make an impact, if I could make a stroke, man, if I, if I could come through with a blow that would literally, that would literally make such a powerful, overwhelming significance that eternity would be different forever and ever and ever because, because I was there, because God used me, because somehow I was involved in a strategic moment of the movement of God. And if I hadn't have been there, God, God wouldn't have been able to pull it off. See, man, I, whoo, I'd, like, I'd like to be involved in that, son. I'd like to really get involved in that. Histories, no. Eternity, yes, man. Oh, if I could, if I could make a difference. But hey, man, how am I going to do that? I'm such an ordinary guy. Such an ordinary person with just ordinary talents and ordinary, ordinary IQ. And hey, I don't have anything really going for me uh, that would be plus that you could say, whoa, yeah, I could pull that off. Hey, just ordinary type guy. Ordinary type guy. When you look at the disciples, hey, they, they were from Galilee. <laughs> yeah, that is 11 of them were. Judas Iscariot wasn't, but the other 11... The eleven that were at the crucifixion and resurrection, and the one, the ones that made it in. Uh, that, y that, you know, they, they were they were from Galilee. Huh. Talk about ordinary people. Yeah, Galilee was way up north. You know, Judah, Jerusalem was down here. Uh, sea of Galilee, River Jordan, Sea of Galilee up here, Dead Sea down here, River Jordan, Judah down here, Jerusalem was down here. You know, all the top people, the big shots, they're all down here. Uh, you know, the people that write the fat books, the real scholars, the guys that got it all together, uh, the people with real potential, the Jews who are real Jews, they all live down here in Judah. But way up here, way up here is, a, is the third providence. You got Judah, Samaria, and then you got this third providence was Galilee. It was something like 80 to 100 miles away from uh, Judah, and Jerusalem area. And, and, and all the disciples were way up here in Galilee. And what kind of people were they up there in Galilee? <laughs> Man, they were country folks, you know, had dirt under their fingernails. They weren't refined. They, they read comic books instead of, uh, instead of real books. They watched a lot of TV. You know, they, they didn't have really anything. They were, they were, they were working class people, you understand. Just, uh, just ordinary folks, fought a lot, yelled a lot. Hey, they weren't cultured, you know, listen to country and western music. They, they, they fished, that was their business, you know, they hacked it out. They, they really, they were just ordinary kind of folks, you know. Nothing special, no big talent, no big ability. Nothing that you'd say, oh man, they, they really are significant, they're sharp. Just average type guys, small in their thinking, small time guys. Argued a lot, you know. Yeah, they used to fighting. In fact, they've argued with Jesus for one solid week, almost one solid week, six days. Hey, all, all over this issue about the content of his messiahship. They believe in chapter 16, they, they express it that he's the Christ, the son of the living God. But hey, when it, come to, it came to the practical play out of that and, and what he really was as a messiah and, and, and what, what, what the significance of the content of that is all about, hey, they missed it entirely. They, they really did. They just missed it entirely. Huh. What, are you, what are you gonna say about them? Just ordinary people carrying on ordinary lives, doing ordinary kind of things, we look at them and say, hey, you're not, we, are you surprised? Come on, argued for six days, surprised? Argued with Jesus, are you surprised? Come on, that's the way they are, just ordinary people. See, they had big dreams. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, they had fantasies, yeah, about ruling and, you know, thrones and 
Man, if they could attach themselves to Jesus, had big plans for him, brother. Hey, if they could attach themselves to Jesus, the Messiah, believing that he was, have him go down to Rome, oh, wouldn't that be something? Hey, kick Caesar off the throne, set up his own throne. He, uh, he would set up thrones for them. All of them would reign and rule, and they would be big shots. Man, how can, woo, wouldn't that be something? That would be, that would be beyond their wildest dreams. But you know, Jesus just wouldn't cooperate. <laughs> what else can you say? I mean, he just, he just wouldn't cooperate. They had these big dreams of stuff they wanted to pull off, and Jesus just wouldn't get with the program. See, Jesus kept talking about dying and, and losing his life. And they kept talking about reigning and ruling, and wow, this is going to be great. Let's do some more magic tricks. See, Jesus kept talking about suffering and bleeding and and giving your life away and, and losing yourself. And they kept talking about conquering and, and overcoming and, and sitting on the throne. And <laughs> see, they just, somehow they just didn't talk the same language. Jesus kept talking about bleeding and giving yourself up. And they kept talking about taxation and, and ceremonies and, and how we're going to make some more money and, and, and living high. And see, that was their comfort. That was their deal. Jesus kept talking about bleeding, suffering, and dying. They kept talking about solve my problems and eliminate my suffering and make me feel better and heal my body and give me what I want. Hey, you look at them, pretty ordinary, huh? Just average, ordinary kind of folks. Then you come to the Mount of Transfiguration. Hey, they've argued with Jesus over this thing for some time. And guess what? Moses and Elijah came down and, oh, good night. They're talking about the same thing. Yeah, bleeding, suffering, and dying. You'd think Moses and Elijah would come down and say, Woo, heaven is great, brother. My, oh, that lazy boy recliner that I have. The big screen TV. Really love that, man. Oh, eat chocolate, don't get fat. That's really great, brother. Hey, this heavenly stuff, I, everybody ought to die right now and go. I mean, it's really fantastic. And Jesus... Hey, he didn't talk about that. Then Moses and Elijah didn't talk about that either. They came down, all the law, all the Old Testament, and the whole conversation was about bleeding, suffering, and dying. Like, that's the end thing? <laughs> Mercy. Hey, that's the big deal? So even Moses and Elijah aren't cooperating with the big plans that the Messiah had, that, that the disciples of the Messiah have. Hey, they just didn't get with the program. And then, then in verse 5 of chapter 17, lo and behold, the Father comes down. Guess what he has to talk about? <laughs> he emphasizes the same thing. This bleed, suffer, and die. He's pleased with his son and what he has to say, so shut up and listen to him. Oh, forevermore. Hey, we're talking about ruling and conquering and overcoming and setting up a throne and making people bow before us and being big shots. And you're talking about serving and uh, and losing your life and giving yourself up and bleeding, suffering, and dying and redemption and forgiving and oh man, hey, even the Father got in on it. So Moses and Elijah have come down and they've joined Jesus in this, this, this cross-style talk and then the Father comes down and he joins in this cross-style talk. It's the same old thing. Man, this is all confusing, isn't it? Really confusing. Because we've been raised in the church and, and the church has been all about solve my problems, make me feel good. Uh, hey, give me joy, peace, and give me, uh, give me love and comfort, and hey, take me off to heaven, and wow, mansion in the sky, praise God, no more suffering, no more dying. Hey, that's all going to be eliminated. Eliminate a lot of it now, please. Hey, and, and that's what I've been raised on. And here's this Jesus, he's, he's the Messiah. He, caught, he keeps talking about bleeding, suffering, and dying. So it's really confusing. In fact, we're on our way down from the mountain in verse 9. Yeah, we're coming down from the mountain and Jesus turns to us and says, Hey, don't tell this vision to anyone. Hey, keep a lid on this one, man. I, I, don't, want, I don't want this known until the proper time. Yeah, just keep still about this. Well, that's confusing, isn't it? Why would Jesus do that? You'd think Jesus would say, Hey, guys, after this experience, man, go out there and tell everybody, boy. Hey, tell everybody about the man on transfiguration. Tell everybody about how Moses and Elijah came down and the kind of conversation I had with them and how, hey, you were really impressed with all that and wanted to build three tabernacles. Go out and tell everybody. Jesus said, Keep still. Why would he say that? Oh, that's easy, isn't it? Because the disciples were confused, man. Yeah, they were confused. They couldn't... 
They couldn't get a handle on this. They already had been rebuking Jesus about this style of the cross and, hey, that can't be, and yet Moses and Elijah talked about it, the Father talked about it, everything seems to point in that direction, but this isn't anything like what we've been taught and where we wanted to go and what we really thought we were getting ourselves involved in forevermore. What's the big deal? Hey, Jesus, we're, we are confused. We really are confused. So Jesus said, keep still, because you haven't got it figured out. And who knows what kind of sermons you'd preach on this, man. Yeah, who knows what kind of stories you'd make up about this Mount of Transfiguration. So just button your lip, brother, till, hey, it really comes to you and you get it, you get it down. So just keep still about all that. And the disciples admitted, if you look at verse uh, 10, they admitted, yeah, you're... You're probably right, Jesus. These three disciples looked at one another and said, Yeah, you're probably right, Jesus. We are a little confused. Certainly do have some questions, some things we can't figure out. Look at verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus, we've, we've been taught all of our lives that before the Messiah can do his thing, Elijah has to come and do his thing. And so, hey, yeah, we are confused because, see, we, we, we believe with all of our heart that you're the Messiah, that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that what we've got, our, got it figured out is that uh, probably what's happening is you're just kind of treading water. Yeah, you're just kind of uh, waiting. You're in a, in a waiting period. And what you're waiting for is Elijah to be raised from the dead. Stomp into town and do his thing. Because you, the Messiah can't do your thing until Elijah comes and does his thing. So you're just kind of waiting. Yeah, you're in a waiting game until this Elijah shows up. And of course, what we've been taught right out of Malachi, yeah, Malachi. In fact, uh, Malachi chapter 4 verse 6 gives it to us. Uh, and our Sunday school teacher really described it well for us. They taught us that, whoa, Elijah was going to be raised from the dead. That'd be something, wouldn't it? He was going to trip with the dew of the resurrection. He was going to he was going to be about 10 feet tall by that time. Uh, resurrection kind of makes you taller. And he was going to march into Jerusalem. And as he marched into Jerusalem, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, the earth was going to tremble and he'd come with this great powerful presence and he'd march into town and wave his hand. Teenagers would straighten themselves up and great social reform would come about. And before he got done, he'd kind of get everything in its proper place. Then the Messiah, which we believe you are, Jesus, the Messiah would come marching in, kind of tiptoe through the tulips, uh, kind, of a, kind of a glorified waltz, and would, would just kind of float his way in, sit on the throne, run the show, take care of everything, rule the place, really be great. And Elijah, of course, would be his hit man. Elijah would kind of keep things in order, straighten things out, and Elijah would do the work that the forerunner, the Elijah guy, is supposed to do. That's so what we've been taught. You remember, of course, that uh, Jesus was dying on a cross. And they gathered around him and they heard, heard him say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, of course, he did it in the Latin language. And, and it was Eli, Eli. And, and that's kind of like Elijah, Elijah. And when you say it in the, in the proper Hebrew style, it comes out Elijah, Elijah, as it was said in the Hebrew. And... Uh, in that, in that Hebrew, they, they thought, oh, as they responded in Matthew, they said, oh, he's calling for Elijah. See, that was the kind of thing. Elijah was supposed to be the hit man of the Messiah. Hey, and any time the Messiah got into trouble, which if Jesus is the Messiah, he's definitely in trouble now, hanging on that cross. And he's calling for Elijah to come and get him out of this. Let's just wait and see, they said, if Elijah comes. Hey, just hang tight. Let's watch this, see what happens. Hey, this is going to be good. So they just hung around, made fun of him because he was calling on Elijah, which again is what they had been trained that the Messiah was going to do and who the Elijah was going to be. So it was all about, hey, this Elijah guy, hey, was supposed to come and do this phenomenal rescuing and straightening everything out and he was supposed to be this big giant. So the disciples said, yeah, Jesus, we are confused because we've been looking for this, this, this Messiah, this Messiah forerunner, this, this Elijah guy, Elijah to come forth from the dead. Hadn't seen anybody that we recognized that even came close to looking like him. Nobody with that kind of power. 
So we got the idea that you're just kind of sitting around. You're just kind of uh, treading water. You're just kind of doing a few miracles here and there. Just keep things, uh, just keep occupied. But the real work that you're going to do, like march right down there to Rome, kick Caesar off the throne, set up your own throne, run the show, straighten this whole thing out, set up the kingdom. You're kind of waiting to do that until the Elijah guy, the forerunner, he shows up. Now Jesus has a phenomenal answer to that. And of course he begins to move into that answer uh, in the uh, next verse. It's verse 11 and it says, Indeed Elijah is coming first and he will restore all things. So Jesus says, you guys are dead on. Yeah, you're dead on. That's exactly right. Uh, that aspect of it certainly has been proper in your teaching. That Elijah is coming first. But see, Elijah has come, he says, but I say to you, Elijah, verse 12, I say to you, Elijah has come already, and they did not know him. See, they didn't recognize Elijah. Uh, why? Because, see, Jesus says, let me explain it to you. God is doing significant things, but it's not through 10-foot giants. It's not, it's not through guys that have been raised from the dead, you know, and and drip with the dew of the resurrection and stomp in and flip their hand and teenagers straighten up. That, that's not the way God is operating. See, God is doing significant things, but He's doing it through ordinary, just run-of-the-mill, everyday kind of people. See, it's ordinary people who make the difference. See, that if God wants to get something done really significant, He picks out people like you. Not people of great talent, not people of great ability, not people with overwhelming high intellect, all that kind of stuff. It just picks out ordinary folks, you know. They need deodorant and their feet get dirty. Just ordinary kind of people like you because you're the kind of people that God can amazingly use to do something through. So guys, you're thinking wrong, see. You've been praying that all of this would take place and God has sent a boat by you half a dozen times, sent a helicopter down, but man, hey, I'm telling you, you, you didn't recognize it, see? You didn't, you didn't see it for what it was. You, you didn't get in the boat. You, didn't, you prayed and God answered your prayer a dozen times. And hey, man, you missed it. You missed it. Because you didn't have the right perspective. Because you were looking for this magnificent, this big deal. You were looking for this talented, tall. You are looking for this giant of a man. You were looking for this, hey... God, God's using ordinary people. God is literally shaking the world. God is literally penetrating society. God is turning things upside down. And how's he doing it? <laughs> ordinary people. Just ordinary people. And God wants to make a difference through you. What are these ordinary people all about? Oh, that's the whole story of John the Baptist. Uh, might I suggest to you, number one, let me give you an outline. What are these ordinary people all about? According to John the Baptist, number one, they're small people. Let's hear it for the small people. Yeah, just John the Baptist, just a small person. In fact, you see it again in that verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Ha! Can you believe that? Hey, no wonder we didn't recognize him. Got his name wrong. See, we, we were looking for Elijah. And here all the time it was John the Baptist. Who, and who would have recognized John the Baptist as a 10-foot giant who was going to move the world and prepare the way for the Messiah to come? Well, that's phenomenal. Nobody would have recognized him. And it's obvious why we didn't recognize him. He wasn't any kind of significant person. He wasn't any kind of, whoa, you went away really impressed. He was, he was kind of weird, in fact. He was kind of really strange. Who, who would have recognized him? In fact, let me give you some ideas about John the Baptist, why we didn't recognize him. Uh, number one, he was an obscure function. Now, we of course, now, as we look back on the scriptures and study the whole thing, we know more about uh, John the Baptist than they did at that particular time, which raises him in our eyes because we know he was the forerunner and really did do a significant thing. But see, in their book, as they viewed the whole thing, he was, he was just an ordinary guy. Yeah, just another guy that didn't make it. As many viewed the person of Christ. Just, just another budding Messiah. Just a guy trying to do some magic tricks and impress some people and build a little following. Hey, John the Baptist, no big deal, man. 
See, we see it through different eyes than they did. But if you could get into their eyes, would you have recognized John the Baptist as the forerunner, the Elijah, in light of everything that they had been taught? Would you have recognized him as the forerunner who was going to literally pave the way for a, a great redemptive program? Hey, would, you, would you have recognized him? Do you, do you know about John the Baptist? I mean, he was a wild-eyed guy. I mean, he had this bushy hair, brother, and, and he, had this, he had this bushy beard, and he had a pulpit that was 100 feet long. Man, he used every bit of it. He was down at one end of the pulpit and then down to the other end of the... He was a wild man! Hey, and his dress, no Sunday suit. Oh, no, no tie. You know what he wore? Just, just a loincloth. <laughs> Whoa, half-naked, brother. Loincloth, yeah, made out of camel skin, which every time you look at him, you wanted to scratch yourself to death. I mean, it had to itch. And, and, and if you got too close to him, oh man, his breath. Whew. He had this terrible breath of locusts because that's all he ate was locusts. And oh, he had some, a little bit of leftover honey. Yeah, locusts and wild honey. Had a little bit of leftover honey right there in the dimple in his chin. Yeah, and you felt like saying, hey, wipe your mouth there, will you uh, 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 John the Baptist? He just he wasn't too cooth and he didn't have, uh, didn't have tack, that's for sure. He'd never gone through the school. Hey, he never had a class on personal integrity or counseling. No, he never, he never, he didn't have any people skills. Yeah, that's the deal. People skills. Hey, he proved it a thousand times. Did you know one day, one day he was preaching, ranting and raving, of course, he had, had a good crowd most of the time, but people just came, you know, out of curiosity to see, good night, what's this guy going to do next, you know? And hey, he was ranting and raving and running up and down, and now, you know, it just attracted a crowd. One, one Sunday morning, one Sunday morning, he was getting ready to preach, and, and the head usher, yeah, the head usher, the head usher came in and uh, said, John, yeah, John the Baptist, yeah, John, uh, listen, uh, 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 the dignitaries have just come. Yeah, the dignitaries, they're on the front row, sitting in their chariot, yeah, parked right over there. Yeah, listen, listen, John, uh, just uh, uh, do me a favor, just, just this morning, please, John, just this morning, John, Comb your hair, will you? Just comb your hair and and, uh, and 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 listen, John. Would you stand in one place? Yeah, just stand in one place. That's it. Just plant both feet solid on the ground and just don't rant and rage. Just stand in one place and and just just give a nice message, John. Just just just. Just give a nice message. Devotional. That's it. A devotional. Yeah. The dignitaries. The king. The king is here. Just, just, just for this morning. You can go back ranting and raving later. But just, just for this morning. Well, John said, I'm trying my best. Want to keep the head usher happy. So lo and behold, he goes out, plants both feet solid on the ground, man. Determined to do it. Yep. Gonna, hey, just give a nice devotion. But as he got started, man, something began to take place. Wow. He began to bob his head. You could see it taking place in him. Man. He couldn't handle it before he got done. Whoa, there he goes. He's down at that end of the pulpit. He's over at this end of the pulpit. Oh, no, good night. He's jumping down into the river. He's running across the River Jordan. He runs right up into, not the king. Yeah, right in the king's face, man. Puts his old bony finger right on the nose of the king and said, I'm talking about you, boy. Hey, you get rid of that woman and get yourself straightened up. You're committing adultery and send her back to her, her real husband. And you get your life straightened up because, hey, hey, the, uh, the Lord's going to get you too, man. And he just gave him what for? Oh, that's it. The head usher passed out, man. That's it. That's it. The congregation, hey, they begin to scatter. It's all over now, man. It's all over now. And indeed, it quickly was all over. Hey, that's the wild kind of guy. I mean, who would come away from that session and say, whoa, that was Elijah raised from the dead. Yes, sir, Elijah, 10 foot tall, bringing social reform. No, see, you don't do that. Not, you don't come out of that session. He was just, see, Elijah, that is the John the Baptist guy, was just an obscure function. See, he, wouldn't, he didn't even have his own identity. See, we were looking for Elijah, Elijah, and he wasn't, his name was John the Baptist. So we even got his name wrong. See, who would have ever recognized this, this, this John the Baptist as the Elijah, the forerunner of, uh, of, the, of the Messiah himself? Who would have ever recognized him? Wow, not me. Hey, if I'd have been there, I wouldn't have recognized him. Again, his function was so obscure because he was just, he was on, he was on the back 40, you know? And, and people had to, it was just curiosity thing, yeah, it was kind of a circus treat. 
Hey, I look at my own life. Just an obscure function. Hey, just kind of passing through. Well, what big deals have you pulled off? Well, well, yeah, yeah, preached to 30 people the other night. Hey, teach a class. Yeah, I'll teach a Sunday school class. Poured my heart into it year after year after year. And yeah, I'll p uh, disappear from the scene. And yeah, hey, in, in, in several years, they'll be wondering, who was that teacher? Yeah, I was in revival in a church yeah, last week. And already they're snapping their fingers saying, ah, uh, who was that guy that yelled at us all the time? What was his name? Yeah, we had him. I remember him. See, just appear on the scene, disappear, gone, so what? Who cares? What difference does it make? What impact? Hey, just an ordinary guy. Hey, I'm just an ordinary guy. No big deal. Just me. Hey, I, I, I'm not going to make any big contribution. Just, just a small person. Just an average kind of fella. Just kind of here. You see, John the Baptist was just an ordinary guy. And what, what's the qualities of this ordinary guy? The quality of the people that really are going to make a difference. Well, they're just ordinary people. Small person, just a small person. He's an obscure function. Let me give you another idea. He was an obsolete flicker. Yeah, just, hey, gone. Did you know his ministry only lasted six months? Six, six months. <laughs> oh, come on. He's the big forerunner? <laughs> Hey, with a ministry of six months? Now, if the guy had planted a church and, and he found that, whoa, it was really grown and next thing you know, he was running 10,000 and then 20,000 and had to have five Sunday morning services and afternoon service and evening service and, wow, just to just to accommodate the people. Man, six, and oh, on TV, on TV, yeah, yeah, TV, doing fantastic miracles, whoa, what a minister, name all over the place, hey, everybody, you know, everybody would look at him and say, wow, 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 yeah, yeah. I can recognize him as the Messiah. Yeah, as the as the forerunner to the Messiah. I can say, yeah, he probably is. Yeah, probably the forerunner. Yeah. Hey, but John the Baptist? <laughs> Six months ministry? Do you realize what his ministry was like, man? Hey, he planted this church. Didn't even have a building. Planted this church down on the banks of the River Jordan. Yeah, planted a church down there. And hey, it... it it, it was only a six-month ministry. Yeah, six months, just bang. Ooh, hey, and he's gone. Yeah, they voted him out. Oh, it was over. In fact, they didn't vote him out, cut his head off. Must have really done something bad. Hey, yeah, John the Baptist. Oh, he didn't have it. Didn't have it together. No, no, no. Couldn't have, he, he couldn't have been, hey, here and then gone. But isn't that typical of life, friend? Here, then gone, man. Hey, I, I breathe today. I don't breathe tomorrow. I'm out of here. Hey, it's a life is like that, son. Just over. It's just whoa. I'm a I'm a I, I, I'm just a flicker, man. It just hey, it just passes. It just just a light that's blown out, a candle that you blow out, man. Just I'm just an ordinary guy. Hey, I'm I'm like John the Baptist. I'm nowhere, man. I'm nowhere. I'm I'm an obscure function. Nobody knows me. Nobody recognizes me. My name isn't in bright lights, and and brother, I'm just a. A, a, an obsolete flicker, wham, and I'm over and done, and hey, it's all gone, and who remembers my name? Let me give you another idea. He was an obvious failure. Oh, it wasn't his fault. Yeah, probably wasn't his fault. We want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Probably trapped by the political climate of his day, and he just was kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time saying the wrong thing and uh oh that got him in trouble. Yeah, that king thing. Unfortunate circumstances. That's it. Just really unfortunate circumstances. Open his mouth at the wrong time. Hey, and uh, hey, it was just it was just too bad. And his head rolled over that one. Yeah, yeah, couldn't couldn't survive it. Couldn't survive it. Just made a mistake. Yeah, too bad. Didn't have the tact anyhow. It just really wasn't the no, people skills. Didn't have the people skills. And and died before for his time. Maybe if he could have lasted a little longer, he might have developed and grown into something really special and important, but hey, it was just the circumstances of the time and, and the king sitting there and, and he just couldn't get out of his pattern and the next thing you know, he's ranting and raving with the finger in the, in the face of the king. You, you can't do that. And especially when you're talking about his woman that's sitting next, this woman that's sitting next to him. Whoa, who isn't his wife? And you don't dare say that kind of thing. But man, he did that and whoa, off comes his head. Next thing you know, there's a wild party and a drunken stupor and the king is, off, is ordering his head cut off and John the Baptist is gone. And uh, 
little impact, hey, little impact. Certainly, John the Baptist, you wouldn't say he impacted anything for eternity, would you? I mean, in a dungeon cell with his head cut off, six months ministry, no big church, didn't write a book, no real miracles, just a, 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 just, just, just a, 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 an obscure function, just a, hey, nobody really significant, ordinary, small kind of guy, just a, just an obsolete flicker, just, whoa, life was over just like that. Ministry didn't last long, just six months. and Just an obvious failure, just an obvious failure. That's John the Baptist, the big time forerunner. But Jesus said something here. Jesus said, look at it again in verse 12. Uh, he says, but I say to you, Elijah has come already and they did not know him but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. Since I want to tell you something, guys. That guy, John the Baptist, you didn't recognize him. You were looking for some ten-foot giant, some mighty significant person. But I want to tell you, John the Baptist, while he may have been an obscure function, while he may have been, may have been an obsolete flicker, while, while he may have been an obvious failure, I want to tell you that John the Baptist guy played a major role in the history of redemptive process. That the whole parade of world redemption literally paraded right over his back. I want to tell you that he laid down a blood pavement, son. He foreran a new style. It was the style of the cross. He foreran that thing and the Messiah is going to walk right over the top of his back, brother. Right over the top of his back and plant a cross right in the middle of John the Baptist's back. And hey, he's going to redeem a world because there was this ordinary guy. This ordinary guy who, yeah, he looked like, hey, he's gone. And hey, he was just obscure function, obsolete flicker and obvious failure. And, and didn't John the Baptist, no big deal, hey. But hey, I want to tell you, John the Baptist, that ordinary guy, John the Baptist, the guy you didn't recognize, played a major significant role in the redemption of the world because the Messiah was linked to him and counting on him and literally planted a cross in, in the middle of his back and he foreran the bleed, suffer, and die style of the cross. Hey, I'm calling you, Jesus says. Who are you? Ha! <laughs> Ordinary guy, hey, no talent, no, no, no. Listen, I, I, hey, I'm no big deal. Hey, just ordinary, ordinary kind of person. But hey, I want you to think big, brother. I want you to think big. I want you to expand your thought process. I want you to grab a hold of this. Yeah, you ordinary people, come on. Square your shoulders, you ordinary people. Get your head up high, you ordinary folks. You, you can impact the world because the kind of people God is counting on are people like you. The ordinary people filled with the Spirit of God. The ordinary people who will, who will embrace the style of the cross. The ordinary people who will blaze the new trail. The ordinary people who will die to themselves and quit thinking about themselves, lose their life. Ordinary people. Hey, we're not looking for people of talent. Not looking for people with good looks. Not looking for people with great wealth. Not looking for people who have leadership abilities. We're looking for anybody, any place who will just lose their lives. Who will die to themselves. Who will pour their lives out, who will be filled with the Spirit and allow God to act upon the stage of their life, who won't interfere with the divine movement. We're looking for anybody, any place, who will become so totally His that their lives will be literally tight with His and He can live His life through them. And they won't obstruct, they won't blockade the dynamic flow of the Spirit of God that wants to change a world. Come on, guys. Come on, ordinary people. Come on, you ordinary folks. God wants to use you. Will you get in on the cross style? Will you get in on the cross style? See, John the Baptist, the ordinary guy, he verifies. Come on, he verifies that what Jesus is talking about is the truth. That this is not about pomp and glory. This is not about fancy talent. This is not about sharp, got it all together kind of people. This is about some ordinary people who will literally link themselves with the style of the cross and find that they are a forerunner impacting, impacting eternity forever and ever. Will you be such a person? Hey, will you yield your life like that? Hey, will you come under his dynamic control? Come on. 
Hey, will you allow your life to... Hey, we're not looking for talent. Quit using all your excuses. Quit bowing your head, man. Get your head up high. Get your shoulders straight. Live like you've never lived before. A divine God wants to stomp through your life and rip up a world. Bring redemption to a society. Change lives. Literally double up your fist and suck eternity square in the belly and double her over forever because wow God is using ordinary people just like you and me man who will link in the cross style who will give themselves away hey John the Baptist ordinary kind of guy just a small person hey uh, linked with the cross and its style blazed a trail want to join him Hey, Jesus, I want to give my life to you. Come on. I want to be linked with you. Use me. Walk over the top of my back and plant a cross in my community. Here I am.